asking you and letting you know it's open for everybody, but Mike Brown will be here from 10 to 12 on Saturday and then Sunday on 11 o'clock service. The only excuse as a leader I'm going to take is that you couldn't get out of a job or somebody shot and killed you. Or you had a terrible emergency. Beyond that, I don't want to hear, well, I had activities. I'm asking you for two hours. I don't ask for much. If you're a leader and you want to continue to stay in leadership, I need you to be here. Uh, If you're heading up department, I need you to be here. I believe a great key is going to be taught this weekend that's going to help you propel yourself. We're living in a dishonorable country right now. Most people dishonor. We, and I ain't talking about what we see on Facebook about the police officers and all that. That's dishonorable, of course. I think we dishonor each other. I think we've lost the value of each other. And I think the Bible said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I think the thing that's missing in the church is brotherhood. Look at somebody and say, I think he's right. When brotherhood isn't working right, the neighborhood goes to hell. We need to love one another. We need to care. We, we need to stop the uh, label in, on the lapels of our, our chest and I'm a Christian, you're a sinner, you're a homosexual. I think we need to take all these labels off and move in the love of God and honor each other and in our truths help people move away from the wrong path. Amen? Because you're not better than anybody else. I don't care. Well, you, you just found a be- the right way called Jesus. That don't make you better than the sinner. That just made you smart to find the right way. We got to help people find the right way. Two key, two major things. So Sunday and Saturday, two hours uh, as we talk about honor. Honor in a way I don't think many of you have ever heard it. We're not talking about just honoring preachers, honoring church. We're talking about honor as a key wealth coming up just kind of tell you go to Matt go to John 16 I preached Sunday on Jesus being our standard bearer how many was here Sunday man we were crying on 11 o'clock service when I talked told the story about the white sheet and the in the and the father I was boohoo and you get some tears on you on that one so uh, <clears throat> it got me but as Jesus being a standard bearer for our lives and he said, lift up your head, your redemption, draw it nigh. It, it dawned on me that it, it, you, to lift up your head and lift up your posture is saying something. Go to John 16, John chapter 16. I want to talk to you for about 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes, about a couple of keys that are really helping me direct through the clutter of what's going on. John 16, 20, John chapter 16. Starting in verse 31. Let's start in verse 25. I'll read it and we'll go to, and 33 will be where I want to end you up. But these things I've spoken to you in, fig, in uh, figurative language or metaphors or parables. But the time is coming when I will no longer what? Speak to you in figurative language. I will no longer speak to you in parables or metaphors. But I will tell you plainly about the Father. And in that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that you shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me. And have believed that I came forth from the Father. Now I want to read it again. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time has come. Say the time's here. When I will no longer speak to you in a figurative or a parable or a metaphor language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. It's very important that you get the Father here. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. So he's look up here. He's saying, in that day when you get, when this is done, you're not, you're not going to have to tell me to go to the Father for you. He's saying, I'm going to give you some powerful access. In that day, 27, for the Father himself loves you. 
you got to embrace this. The Father himself loves me. God himself loves me. Look at somebody beside say, God loves you. Look at somebody say, the Father loves you. You have to embrace this. You have to embrace this to get through the clutter. You have to embrace something. You are so important to the Father that Jesus said, I'm telling you plainly, there's going to come a day when you're going to go to the Father and it's not going to have me praying and telling him what you need. He's going to give you an ear to your own mouth because of me. And he said, but here's the kick. And he says, for the Father himself loves you. Why does he love you? Because you love me and have believed that I came from him. Now, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. So where's Jesus? He's with the Father. His disciples said to him, see now, you are speaking plainly and using no uh, figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered in them, do you believe now? Indeed the hour is coming, yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own. And you will, and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. He said, I know you guys, because what happened was, look up here. The disciples got all braggadocious right here. And they go, oh, now you, we got you here. We, we're cool with it. And he said, look it. He said, oh, you believe now. And then he looked at me and said, listen, in just a few minutes, all y'all going to run to your own house scared. One of you is going to deny me. He said, you're going to leave me. Guess where you're going to leave me? All alone. But now he gives you a key to your problem. When everybody you count on leaves you, this is what Jesus said. But let me assure you, the Father will be with me. Now you're going to make it through any problem when you know everybody's kicked you to the curb. But the one person that didn't kick you to the curb was God the Father. Oh, hallelujah. These things I've spoken to you that... And I love that. Now, here comes the truth. That in me you may have what? In the world you will have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. The number one problem with everybody in the earth, the number one problem, the number one problem in the church, the number one problem. Everybody has the same problem. Every band member, every backup singer, everybody sitting here, Every sinner, every saint, the same problem vibrates through people. You know what this problem is? That you think you shouldn't have any problems. That's the number one problem. The number one problem is that you think you shouldn't have any problems. And the, and the truth is everybody has a problem. And we have to have to become under, and understand that uh, problems happen, bad things happen, crisis happens, children go haywire, husbands betray wives, wives betray husbands. You will not live on planet Earth without a problem. And the key that I'm learning on how to get through the clutter when things aren't going your way. How many know what I'm talking about? When things ain't, look at somebody say, I know exactly what he's talking about. When they ain't going your way and you're praying, but it ain't going your way. You're believing, but it ain't going your way. There's just come to this fact that sometimes you've got to outlast the problem. I read an article, I'm going to Malaysia here in a couple of months, thank you Jeremy, I'm going to Malaysia here in a couple of months, and the uh, guy that's bringing me there named Raymond, he sent me an article, and he said, can you comment on this article, because a leader in my church uh, sent it to me uh, with question marks, and the article was from a man 
who was saved in a charismatic church, saved in a spirit-filled church, and was saved for 10 years. And, uh, and the title of the article was, I've been delivered from the prosperity gospel. And so it was interesting to me. So I read the whole article, and it said, uh, God delivered me from the prosperity gospel or from, or from the gospel of prosperity. And so the article was, that he said, I was raised in a charismatic, spirit-filled church, and they taught me, number one, that we have authority. They taught me, number two, that uh, we, we are, uh, that God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory so that we have the right to be what? Prosperous. It, so he's going through all this stuff that the Bible does say we have, but here's what happened. My wife and I had a child, and we stood on those verses, uh, and we called the prophets we knew, and we had encouraging words, uh, but the child didn't get better. The child died. And so when the child died, they, the couple that believed all these scriptures now plummeted in depression because a problem came. And so now he says that, g that he hung out with some uh, Christians, uh, and he realized uh, that he'd been delivered from these false uh, prosperity teachings, uh, and now he's making Jesus number one, and he doesn't believe for anything else. Well, they asked me to comment on this, and so here's my comment. Number one, there's no biblical doctrine called the gospel of prosperity. First of all, the word gospel, look at somebody and say, means good news. That's all the word gospel means. I don't know why you made it so spiritual. Gospel, there's the gospel of exercise. That's the good news of the, the gospel of buffet. That's the good news of a buffet. Okay, so you made the gospel some supernatural word, but it's just a word, okay? It means good news, okay? And the gospel of the Bible, the good news of the Bible, has nothing to do with prosperity. The good news of the Bible has to do with redemption. So what is the gospel of the Bible? That Jesus Christ died to redeem you by the blood of his body. You need to write this down because the problems are going to happen. I'm talking to you about what? Problems. Look at somebody say, I know problems. The gospel of the Bible is that you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. How did you get redeemed? By the blood, not by anybody's blood, not by a blood called an animal, not by a blood called a bull, not by a good teacher, not by a good prophet, not by, you were bought back by the blood of Jesus Christ and you are redeemed. Say redeemed as loud as you can. I said say it, say I am, I am redeemed. redeemed. Say it again, say I am, I am redeemed. redeemed. Now say this, I receive it, I hear it, I see it, I believe it, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Satan hates you for this because you know what? When you receive that you're redeemed, that means you have biblical rights to redemption. Redeemed. You can't have the power of any benefit of heaven until you walk the life of the redeemed. Now the redeemed life means that I know somewhere I needed the blood of Jesus Christ to cover me. So to, to know I need redemption, I have to know I'm a sinner or I've fallen or I'm wrong. And so you get redeemed. Now the problem is we don't talk about redemption. We talk about confession. And the, and the problem is, is if you have confession without understanding redemption, all you got is talking, but you got no walking. And so we got a church who talks the cross but can't walk the blood. And if you don't walk the blood, you can't have prosperity. Because, and so the problem was the guy said, well, I now put Jesus first. Well, that's the problem. He should have put Jesus first first. You don't make Jesus secondary and all the benefits of the Bible primary. Because if you do, then hell is leading you down the wrong gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ. How many believe that right now? Say, I believe it right now. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? 
It is the good news that you can be redeemed. I don't care how far you've fallen. You can be bought. Redemption means it's a, it's a legal term. You've been bought back. Now, you need to know this because the apocalypse is really close. And I'm not trying to scare you. But the apocalypse is so close. I watched a video and I shared it on Facebook of a woman who was part of a jihad who was here, came to this country, and she, and she said, you need to wake up, America. You need to wake up. The Muslims and the Islams are taking over your country, and you're letting them do it. And you're letting them do it because you got caught up in this passive eye, this passivity, and we're just going to church, and we're going to enjoy all this prosperity, but prosperity always has a price, a cost to it. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations. Be of good cheer. You know why? You're redeemed. I've overcome the world. Woo. You see, look at somebody and say, my life is in him. Okay, so now hear me. She said there were six, six Islamic doors of jihad. See, we didn't know that. We thought, and she said, these people blowing themselves up is a is a to, to break your focus. She said because the first jihad that they send to countries is jihad over law, and that Sharia law comes to your country, they start judging you under Muslim law, and you got Sharia law trying to come up in this country. And then she said the second jihad was educational, where they come in and act like they believe in you, but they get in your schools, and they start teaching your children. And then she said the third jihad was they get into the government, and they start becoming government leaders. But, but the religion of, of Islam is to kill the infidel, period. You are sitting on this preface. Do you know this year, and it's, they say by September 30th, they're going to vote in digital cash? Do you understand what that means? Digital cash, that if they vote in digital cash as the primary movement of cash, the American dollar could fall, and the whole world lines themselves up to our currency. That's why we are more blessed than most nations because our money is what everybody attaches to or sets their standard to. But when digital cash comes out, that means they're going to call in everybody's dollar because there's 120 trillion printed dollars. There's only less than 30 trillion in the banks. They want to get the cash out of the mattress, the money out of the jar, the money you got hid in the refrigerator. They want to get all that back. To get all that back, they've got to deem it Unvaluable, And they're going to say to you, digital cash is now cash around the world. And if you want your digital account to go up, you need to bring in your hidden cash. Now, this is supposed to break this year. If that breaks, it could, it could send a shockwave a course, a, a, through our economy. You've got to get your mind set up that problems are a part of the gospel. And we got we to get ready. God says you got to get ready. And here's some things that are helping me adjust internally. And, and even though I become overwhelmed, it's overwhelming, isn't it? Look at somebody say, yeah, it's overwhelming. How can you stay, be overwhelmed but not overcome? How can you be overwhelmed but not overcome? And that's what you have to understand, that problems happen. But God said, I have already overcome the world. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is what happens. Yes, the problem overwhelms me. Yes, the information. But I do not let it detach in me what I believe. This person that gave up this, this gospel, uh, uh, believing the blessing, believing the healer, hurt the move of God, not helped it. He thought his article was nice, but what he did was he put confusion into the church because what he should have did was said, 
I serve God no matter what problem comes my way. And I believe in the word of God whether my son lived or died. I believe whether my, my marriage gets healed or not. You're not going to deter me from the truth of God's word because uh, something didn't go the way I expected it to go. He's still God. The Bible's still true. He's still a God of prosperity. He's still a God that heals. He's still a God that delivers. And by standing up for the truth, uh, he gives God power through his problem. But what he did was he rewrote his theology to accommodate his tragedy. Well, maybe he's not the God he really says he is because my marriage didn't go the way I prayed it would go. No, let me ask you some questions because you need to hear this. Did Jesus walk the earth? Was he all powerful? Yes or no? Tell four or five people, no or yes. Okay, when Jesus walked the earth, was he all powerful? Okay. When he opened his mouth, did things happen? Is that scriptural? When he walked into Lazarus and he was dead and he told him to come out, did he come out? So we know with his mouth he could raise the dead. According to the Bible, he raised the dead. Not only Lazarus, but others that we didn't read about. The Bible said when he said, I am in the garden, a dead man jumped out and started running across the garden with a sheet on him. Did he walk on water? So the elements obeyed him. Was he prosperous? You know, some Christians think he wasn't. He's broke. I said, I had a guy on, on Facebook today that said, well, G no, Jesus was broke. Really? Then why did he have a treasurer? Why did he have a treasurer named Judas? And why is Judas so mad? Because they're, he, they're spending money. Because they had money just because he's trying to take some for himself. The Bible said he had his own house. Did you know Jesus owned his own house? Do you know that John the Baptist's disciples came and stayed at Jesus' house, the Bible said, and never went back to John? They said, he's sleeping in the wilderness. He's sleeping up here in your house. We're going to be your disciple now. <laughs> well, Jesus walked, you know, he was barefooted. No, he wasn't. But see, we have this false theology. So he was all-powerful. He walked on water. Did he stand up in a boat and tell the winds to stop blowing? Did he? So we know the winds obeyed him. So he's all powerful. He tells the winds. He can tell the storms. He can walk on water. He, he told the fish to eat the gold. Did he tell Peter to go fishing, open the mouth, and get the gold and pay your taxes? He has the anointing to pay taxes. How many owe some taxes right now? We want to talk to the Holy Ghost right now. He paid him. And then he said, because you went fishing for me, pay your taxes too. Hallelujah. I'm going fishing so I can get my taxes paid. He did all this. Let me ask you a question. Did he die on the cross? So his life didn't end up the way he was living, so we need to wipe it all out. It's not true because it ended up bad. It ended up not in his favor. He got crucified. He got beat. He got cussed out. He got spat on. So he must not have all authority. We must not be the God he thought he was. Maybe he didn't live right. That's what it was. He, he missed a formula on his faith that day. That's what it was. You know what? He forgot to quote his scripture that day. That's what it was. He didn't get up and do his Bible that day. So he got crucified, y'all. No, that was God's will. And you have to walk your walk knowing this. Yes, there's prosperity. Yes, I'm going to be blessed. And yes, I got authority. But sometimes I have to also submit to God's will. And it was God's will for him to go to Calvary. It was God's will for him to be crucified. It pleased him, the Bible said, that he died. Because of his obedience, the world got redeemed. So what I'm trying to tell you is, is that if a problem comes, God sees the bigger picture by you overcoming it. Oh, hallelujah. And this is where you understand. The problem is you think you shouldn't have any problems, but without problems, you have no power to help anybody come out of anything. Amen? So you understand that. Life doesn't always give you lemonade. I don't even like lemonade. Give me sweet tea. But problems happen. And people don't know how to deal with it. And, and, and people just quit the church. They blame God. 
Quick to turn. My, my, so it's, it, it's sad, it's tragic that, that he lost the child. But what's worse than losing the child is he lost his position in the word. The child's in heaven. But he gave up an opportunity to be a great witness that he's still a blessing even when there's a problem. How many could lift your hand right now and say, you're still a blessing even in my problem? He's still God in my problem. He's still God in my problem. He's still God in my problem. Because the, pro the reason that we have to understand this is that we think we shouldn't have any problems, so when problems come, they depress us. And you know how we know, this is what he said, your posture begins to show your faith. And Jesus said, when it comes in, lift up your head. So he said, and your redemption will draw to you. And it dawned on me that God don't move to you till he sees your posture change in your faith. God doesn't go toward you with the blessing until he sees your posture shifting in your faith. And the faith posture looks up. The depressed posture always looks down. And, and, and listen, people, the inconsistency of your walk is costing you his favor. The inconsistency of your praise. When you got to, you know, we, I understand people got to work and people got, uh, the, you know, things they can't get out of. But when you got to beg somebody who you know has the time to go do an event for the kingdom and you got to keep begging them, they're telling you they are inconsistent in who they believe they are. Well, you just don't know what my husband's doing. Well, he may not get better, but where are you? He may overwhelm you. But are you letting him disconnect inside of you your identity, your belief system, your joy? So your joy is intact in you, not on you. And I'm having to learn this. And two things that I'm learning, they're really helping me. Two things I'm learning. Two things I'm learning for myself. Number one, I'm learning this. I taught it when we went to, uh, what was the name of that church? Full gospel, full, full, full tabernacle? No. Fellowship Tabernacle Church in Statesville. I was there Saturday night. No, I was there Sunday night. And I'm, I'm, too, I'm preaching too much. I can't remember where I was. Two things that's really helping me, two keys that I'm learning for myself. Number one, mastering the art of receiving. I'm learning to master the art of receiving. And I'm not talking about somebody giving me something. That's part of it. But I'm talking about receiving from the Holy Spirit. Mastering the art of receiving. Do you know what? Most people come to church and, and, and we need to stop and we need to start asking people, think about it. What did you really come here for tonight? I mean, what did you, what'd you give up an hour and a half, two hours for? Really, what did you come here? What, was you trying to, what did you expect to get when you came here? What were you looking for when you came? What was the real reason you're here? Because Christians are so surface in their life, they don't get down to the deep. What, what do you really need from God? What, what, do you, what, what questions tormenting you over and over? See, I, I'm asking, there's questions in me that I'm asking all the time. They're tormenting me. And God said, you got to get to, you, you're not getting to the answer of these questions. You're asking them because you're letting what's around you overwhelm you, but it's getting in you. And you can't receive from me, wounded. You can't receive from God, angry. You can't receive from him, agitated. You can't receive what you need from God, overwhelmed. Because when you're, when you're in a problem and you're really overwhelmed, You'll take any answer to calm you. And a lie could calm you when you don't need it. Because when you, guys, what God said, you got to quit hearing so many voices. The, the clutter is drowning out my whisper. I'm trying to talk to you, but the problem is speaking louder than my whisper of faith. 
I'm trying to tell you. And look, it's so, it's so, so I'm going to master that. And I'm going to teach more on this art receiving because if you can't receive, you can never get beyond where. And some of you, you've been coming for years and you're still broke. You come here, you've been here for six months and you're still sleeping in an unwed bed and nobody, and, and, and if to, until you get deep down and quit being surfacy and act like you got it all together and say, you know what, I'm jacked up right here and I need to fix this part of me so that I can be, get the full blessings of God and master the art of proper receiving. And it's not about judging you, it's about changing you. It's about healing you. Because until you make standards, everybody's taken from you. It's true. Master, they aren't receiving. I had a friend call me, I was coming out of the uh, to get my hair cut, and a friend that never hardly calls me, we're great friends, but, you know, we don't have to talk every day to be good friends. And he calls me, he says, can you talk? And usually I thought, you know, when somebody says, can you talk now, what does that mean? It, it sums up. So I call him, I go, what's up, bro? He said, oh, no, it's, everything's cool. But I had a dream last night, and he said it was so vivid. And I said, okay, tell me about it. He said, well, he said, you were getting married. I said, I was. He said, yep, you're getting married. I said, and I just listen. I didn't say nothing. I'm just thinking, you know. Okay, and he says, and I was doing, I'm officiating the wedding, okay, and I go, all right, he says, and you're, you look burdened, your face looked frustrated, and I saw all these people, all, all, all these people trying to talk to you, all these voices. He said, I stopped doing the ceremony, and I came off of the platform, and I walked down there where you were getting married, and I whispered in your ear, and when I started talking to you in your ear, your countenance changed, and the burden lifted off your face, and joy came on you, and I went back to the pulpit, and I woke up. He said, I got out of bed today. At, it was 4 in the morning. He said, I got up at 4 in the, this morning, and I've been laying before God for you, Bishop, and I said, man, thank you. He said, but listen, I said, God, this dream is so vivid. What is it about? And he said, that marriage ceremony is the church. And Bishop is married to the church. He said, but he's hearing so many cluttered voices. And he said, and you are me in the dream. And you call him up and tell him to listen for my whispers and stop listening to the clutter of other voices. Oh, hallelujah. Said, cause what he said, tell him that he's going the right way. Oh, hallelujah. The guy hadn't talked to me in months, and, 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 and now he's up. So, you know what? But that's it, the clutter. And you know what? The art of receiving. What did you come here to receive tonight? What? We're taught, and I'm going to teach you on this very heavy. You just need to get it. It's just, I'm gravy in it right now. But we're fixing to make the cake. Because until I fix you in here, you can't receive right. That's why you're having terrible relationships. That's why you're depressed. That's why you, 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 you'd rather sleep in a bed and not, get, and not have covenant instead of being alone and looking for covenant. Because you can't receive Number two, this has really helped me. Theme your day. Name the theme of your day. Look at somebody say, theme your day. What it, when, when you wake up, see, how you're going to receive today is how you theme it. I woke up yesterday, and I just started this. I taught it a couple of weeks ago. I've been mulling it in my spirit. I woke up the other day and I themed, I woke up and here's what I said, I themed today, the day is a conquering day. I themed today as a conquering day. And I got so much done that day because as soon as I themed it, I received it. I'm theming my day. Today I woke up and I said, today is a, a, a worship day. Today I'm going to worship you because it's midweek. I'm, it's my day today to think about you. I'm going to worship you. And I was in my office talking to God and crying when everybody left for a while. And then here I told Pastor, 
go longer on praise and worship. Why? Because I themed my day to day as staying in. And the worship was incredible because when you name your theme, you receive it. I'm going to get up. To, I theme my day today, the day of joy. I'm going to theme my day. It's joy day. I'm going to, nothing going to steal my joy. I theme, I'm going to receive my joy today. Oh, hallelujah. And that's how you receive. Your expectation shifts when either you name the theme of your day or by the end of the day, the day's going to theme you. And then everything that tries to go against your theme, something happens in your psyche that it keeps your mind lined up to your theme. I did so much. I, could, I mean, I, 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 I worked here. I got things done. I was on the phone. I, we got flyers done. Then I went home. I got my boat, put it in thing, took it to the house. I, I, I washed my whole pressure washer the boat, got inside, cleaned it inside, then, then got it all put back up, then cut my grass. And the sun was just about to go down. And I said, wow. And God said, well, you themed today. You did it. You did a lot today. Of course, I went to bed, felt like a 90-year-old man because I didn't get my body lined up to receive it. <laughs> but you theme your day. Master the art of receiving and theme your day. If you're a waitress, theme it. Theme it. Today's the day I get the best tips. Or theme it this way. I'm talking to Melissa. I don't care what kind of tips I get. They ain't getting a reaction from me. Because they ain't my source. You are. And now she's mastered the art of receiving. I watch this thing. This lady goes to this conference. Uh, it's, a, it's not even a Christian conference. So it's a bunch of 2,500 sinners. Maybe not all sinners, but they all go here, and, and it's a motivational place, you know. They all pay $4,900 to get there. I said, well, we know that ain't church folk. <laughs> you can't get to pay $49 for a conference. <laughs> Christians are the, is, is the, the most notorious people to want everything with an entitlement mind. Give it to me free, I'll come. Well, they paid $4,900 with this one girl, and, 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 the, and the speaker is really good at getting into the, uh, the people's depths of their brokenness. And this girl from Brazil flies from Brazil, and she paid $4,900, and here's what she did. She sold everything she had, even her furniture, and to come to this place And because she said, I need a breakthrough. She said, I need a breakthrough so bad, I sold everything I had to get here. And this ain't a gospel thing. I thought, my God, if you could get people to do this for the gospel. The gift to Christ. And while she's standing there, the guy says to her, well, what's the problem? And she starts really telling the problem. And next thing you know, she was born in some kind of uh, fa false religion. And, and, she's, and this is what she said. She said, all my, my parents had eight children. We are in this, this God kind of religion. And the only thing that you, you can only show love by sex. So if you don't, if you love, you gave sex. So we were giving sex to everybody in this thing. And she said, and and I, and this she starts bawling. And she says, and I am the strength for my whole family, my my brothers, my sisters. We're all out of this thing now, and we know it's 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 whacked and it's jacked. She said, and I'm trying to keep him happy and him focused and her focused. And she says, and honestly, I'm tired. And then she starts crying. And here's what she says: I don't really know what what real love is and, it, and do you really love me because I've been trained to give love wrong and she just and when she said that she just fell and I was sitting there tears rolling down my eyes because I'm thinking man I need to be with that I need to tell that lady about Jesus I need her to get all that out but then let her go home with the Holy Ghost And I watch the, the, the men cry and the women. And they're not church people. And they're all going. And I hear them yelling, but we love you. We love you. And he said, stand up on this chair. And she stood up on the chair. And she said, he said, look around at people. And they're not, they're not church people. And they're saying, we love you. We believe in you. We, we don't want nothing from you. And she's bawling. And here was what got me. She sold everything she had to go there to, for a breakthrough. And then they're riding back to the house and uh, back to the office, and they're giving the speaker reports on what's going on in the conference. Of, there's like 30, like 3,000 people. And they brought up that girl. 
they said, that girl from Brazil, yeah, yeah. He said, man, people in her, they had little groups. In her little group, community, da, 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 da. A businessman on the other side of the room walks up to her and says, here, listen, I'm a very wealthy businessman. And listen to your story. She, he didn't know she sold anything or not. He said, here, and gave her $50,000. He said, here's a check. And he looked at her and said, I love you. And I'm not asking nothing from you. And she started bawling. And another businessman caught her on the way out and said, listen, you've been abused. Here's $50,000. I love you. And I don't want nothing from you. And she left this thing with $100,000. And when I sell that, I said, that's exactly what the church should be like. So blessed that we can meet needs of others. And love. But no, we run in here and are all, would all, because we think we shouldn't have any problems. So we run in here, we're trying to get all our problems fixed when we didn't realize our problems are what God's going to use to bring the blessing to us to help others. So we've got to master the art of receiving. And we've got to theme our day. I'm theme, and we start theming our Sundays. This is the Sunday we, we have money to bless people like that. I theme this Sunday, Sunday cancer dries up this Sunday. See, so we think this, this weekend, I theme it. It's, it's we learn how to honor each other and God. Amen? Master the art of receiving and what? Theme your day. Father, we love you and we thank you. There's so much we need to know we don't know. We know we're a, a timely church. We know we're a last day church. We know that we're set here for the kingdom surge. We know that nominal churches and the, and the other churches, they love you, but they don't have the spirit that they need to move against the Antichrist flow. God, raise us up as, as Antichrist destroyers in Jesus' name. Help us to master the art of, how many would master the art of receiving right now? Lift both your hands and say, I receive right now what Bishop's saying. Help me master the art of receiving. I, now say this, say, I receive you, Jesus. I can't go anywhere until I first receive you. And Lord, I'm going to theme my day. My day will not theme me no more. I will name my day before it names me. In Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, give me a good praise and a clap and a shout. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Amen. Stand to your feet. Hug somebody. Bless somebody. Tell them you love them. You can't wait for Saturday, 10 to 12. We're going to come in here and do, do our teaching. And then Sunday at 11 a.m. If you're watching, thank you for being a part of Periscope. Thanks for being a part of Facebook. Thank you. We love you. We're asking you now to theme your day. And master the art of receiving. We're going to come back and talk about it more. We'll talk to you later. Follow us on all the social media. Share us. Like us on Facebook. Get us out there. We are a local church with an international voice. We love you. We'll talk to you later. Take us away, Jeremy.